don't drive where you grow grain and don't grow grain where you drive. That's as basic as it is. So why control traffic? Um, well, we know soil is compact and we know that the first pass creates 90% of the damage. So the idea of having every single machinery on permanent tracks um, is underpinned by that first point. It only takes one pass. And even, even when soil's dry, we can still do damage with our heavy machinery, particularly the harvester. Um, we know in our no-till um, or minimum till farming systems, we're still covering, if you haven't done any matching up of machinery, you're still covering around about 40 to 70% of your country every year with tracks. So there's significant benefits. Um, if we can bring that down to 9 to 11% in control traffic. Well, obviously we're hoping to have some more yield and hopefully some of the data that we're doing this year will and down on the long term trial that they've had down there, that's proven that there's a bit of a yield benefit there. I'm not sure of the exact figures, but also um, you do notice going across the sands and what have you, how much easier it is to go across it and the fuel saving uh, is quite an amount. Like even as soon as you get off those tram tracks, you just feel feel the difference, huge difference. The benefits of controlled traffic here, uh, fuel savings, number one is, is, a, is, a real fuel, is, a, is a real saving you make straight away. After one or two years, of, once you've made your controlled traffic lines, fuel savings big. I think you don't need to have as big as machinery like as in tractors to tow, tow a chase bin or, or a boom spray because you're driving on virtually a road. You don't need that extra horsepower, 100 horsepower, 50 horsepower to, to tow your boom spray through what you've already deep ripped. So, you, so not only are you um, not ripping where you're driving, but then you're not having to spend the money pulling something through what you've already deep ripped in the first place. Just, just the inputs that we're putting in are getting a hell of a lot less. Because um, oh, we'll probably do that down later on the, on the trials down there. But yeah, just reduce of inputs, um, less fuel, yeah, fuel bills coming down. I mean, we wouldn't be interested in it if there wasn't an economic return in it, would we? The, one of the impediments to it is actually the cost and also just the thought of, you know, it just seems such a hard thing to try and achieve to work towards an end. So you've got to take time to do it. If you if identify something you can improve on, you want to be able to do it straight away, but controlled traffic takes a few years because you can't replace all your machinery in one year. So that's a bit frustrating. I find the harvesters the hardest to um, line up and, you know, get, get working in. Uh, the main barriers I've found is, is, is deciding what size uh, spacing or what size machinery you need to acquire. Um, there's not a perfect size and you just need to fit it in with what you want to do and what fits in with your system. It's one of the hardest parts is, is finding, finding um, like-minded people that you can talk to that have problems that you can share to sort out problems and to find working workers or employees that understand what controlled traffic is about so they don't drive everywhere. Yeah, up until now I've just been, it's just been gut feel and, and what I feel is right and, but coming down here I'm going to learn, a, I've learned a great deal out of this, this is fantastic. Even just, there's been a few things like where people have come in that aren't aware of the system and haven't followed the track. Also, if you want to use contractors, um, yeah, are they going to be able to line up on your program or what have you? The biggest thing is keeping educating workers to where they can drive. Agronomists aren't too bad. <laughs> <laughs> when Paul couldn't uh, make a, a tramline farming tour of uh, growers back in 2001 in New South Wales where we visited, nearly every grower we came across said we wished we'd started with the header. I mean, everyone over there started with the GPS on their sprayer, then went GPS on the cedar, and oh, we'll do the header later too, home. And then when they come back and saw all these header tracks, 
with the crop dying on it, or dropping, dropping down low. They all said, oh, we wished we'd started with the header. We started with our um, heavy equipment first, because that does the most amount of damage. Knowing that during, um, during a wet harvest, harvester and chaser are going to do more damage than anything else. Um, you have to pick a size that, that you can afford to get to and then try and match your equipment and wheel sizes and, and, and um, wheel distances. Um, modifying equipment's hard because machinery dealers don't like trading in modified equipment unless you can put it back to the way it was. And um, it's, yeah, understanding that metric 10 inches or metric measurements are not the same as Imperial <laughs> measurements when you come to modify equipment and row spacings. It's, um, and it's just a bit of thought really. Go and have a look around and see what other guys are doing and, and, and go from there. If you're going to get into it, the, probably the one thing I could, I could offer you is, is measure twice and cut once because it's very important that you get your wits right and match things up properly. Um, I've traded more header fronts back than I can count on because guys have thought they were buying a 40 foot front and it cuts 39 foot 6. So, um, as one of the speakers said this morning, get your tape measure out and um, and even though you can trust what we tell you, some of the other salesmen don't necessarily tell you the truth. <laughs> one of the things that I think with a lot of precision ag stuff is actually the availability of people to uh, the expertise, in many cases, to set machines up and also people who can work the software and transfer, um, how would you describe it, uh, information from one steering system to another to make sure that everything does match up because trying to do it manually can be a problem whereas if you could actually do it on a desktop starting with one machine which has the initial run line in it and then transfer that to other monitors other machines that would make life a lot easier. Yeah it's interesting I was just talking to Todd earlier about um, last time we were sort of visiting and looking at control traffic farming about four or five years ago. And the state of the industry back then was, um, if you wanted to get into it, you had to do it yourself. Um, in those five years, the major manufacturers have, have really started to take notice of, of the, I guess, the groundswell of, of farmers who are heading down this direction. Um, so we're now in a position, I think, as an industry that um, the manufacturers are producing products for us uh, to fit into the control traffic um, uh, formats that we want. Some machinery manufacturers are in metric, some are imperial for time spacings. Uh, wheel sizes are a bit hard to get to get sorted. You just got to think ahead a little bit when you, if you are buying a new piece of equipment, they, they can do small modifications like um, um, change rim centers on chaser bins and other equipment that doesn't take a lot, but it's not a costly expense, but it's uh, it's something they can do. Track machines are the way to go, I reckon. They've come a long way with their with their roughness years ago. You used to belt your head around the cab and everything would vibrate, end up on the floor by the time you got to where you wanted to get. <laughs> so yeah, uh, it's tra track machines are the way to go, I reckon, in the future. That's what we'll be upgrading to anyway. I would say to other farmers wanting to get into controlled traffic farming that they they need a plan. That's even even considering where you put your tram lines and you have to think you have to think at least ten years in advance. I've got sheep in my system, so they still play a major role in our business. But I need to consider if they if they eventually disappear and we're 100% crop, I need that that has a big influence on where those tram lines go and fences coming out. So there's a lot of you need to really think a long way down and a long way into the future in regards to trams and and um, acquiring the right machinery. There are a few compromises because it has to be a system that you can do at the end of the day. Like you've got to be. There's sort of, you try to get as best as you can, but unfortunately we probably 
not 100% perfect, but we'll try to maintain as much as we can. Rome wasn't built in a day, and you do one step at a time, as you can afford it. So, mm. I think it's well worthwhile, but uh, like previous people have said, it's just something that's a, a slow process. You know, as you replace gear, you've got to keep it in mind, you know, what you're aiming towards. And then I don't know what's going to happen down the track because we're all constantly getting bigger. If the first machine you, re you, you lined up for controlled traffic, say your seat was on 60 foot and your next one's 80, then you've got the whole process again. You sort of, I don't know how you'll get on. We, we sort of get locked into a certain width, whereas we had, in years gone by, our widths of everything have constantly got bigger every year. So how we get on there, I don't know. The advice to other farmers would be, Really basic, go and, go and jump over the fence and have a look at all the stuff ups that someone who started with because we made plenty. You know, you, 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 you've got no one to learn from, so you make plenty. You get laughed at a lot and uh, you go and have a look at all the stuff ups and you, you will get there much quicker than what we did. You know, that's it, really. But yeah. I'd go and do it. There's no disadvantage in doing it.